Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mike Kay. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, what it comes out, you know, is going to come out. Hey, guys, a couple things here. You know, I never... um I never started with this, but I just dawned on me when you said it's a dry month. Uh, you know, I, I actually had an overdose the day before St. Patrick's Day about seven years ago. And uh, my wife had to do sternum rubs on me to get me to breathe again. And that's uh, that's seven years ago tomorrow. And actually, that's that's pretty hardcore for me. Just, you know, to this year is the first time it actually snuck up on me. And um, yeah, so let's let's figure out how we got there and then what it's like now. Because my sobriety date is June 15th, 2020. Um, uh, my last drink was June 14th, 2020 during the pandemic. And, um, you know, so I'm really grateful and happy to be here. And thanks for the offer. So, yeah, a little bit about what it was like. So my, my name, my name is Mike Fourth with an IV, like literally a Roman numeral on my birth certificate. And for whatever reason, I thought that meant something. Like, I thought I was born on third base. My dad was mayor of my little town, you know, when he was 31 years old. And here I am, like, second grader in the newspaper with a Roman numeral, you know, puffing my chest out, praying around school. Basically, I hadn't done shit. I I, I hope I can curse. That's that's all right. Once in a while, I'm not going to overdo it. Yeah, I'm not going to overdo it. But, like, so so here I am. So so I got nothing to show for myself except that I think I'm worth something. So I actually remember lying. And I never really put two and two together, but – that's what it was. I was literally, I was an egomaniac with an inferior, inferiority complex from, from the moment I had my first memory. And I just thought that I had to just prove my worth and, and, and you know, made up anything. So um, that was great and all, except, you know, huge, huge, huge formative years of my life were the fact that my sophomore year of high school, and I make a point to say this, not my freshman year, my sophomore year of high school, I was four feet, 10 inches tall and 90 pounds. Um, you know, and it, I had braces, which I like just got on. So yeah, I did not have sex in high school. I did not have a girlfriend in high school. Um, uh, I wanted to be Mike Kerwin with the Roman numeral party and, you know, somebody. And I wasn't, I was like just a stunted growth. You know, I'm, I'm a six foot tall, normal guy now, but you know, this is, this was huge. And so I got bullied. All my friends who I saw after school would be my friend would ignore me at lunch during school. Um, you know, and just like, I didn't, who I wanted to be or thought I was did not match um, what was going on in my life. And that obviously, not obviously, but that did change um, when I had my first beer. And I literally screamed, yes, because I was so tall, tiny, probably like crushed me off half my first beer. I was 10 feet tall. I was hilarious. I said all the things that like, I thought I would, you know, and I made an actual persona about it and it was like called tornado mike hurricane mike big mike you name it i was this guy and i actually made a conscious decision to take this guy big mike to uh university of maryland and i told my parents on the way down i said everything you knew about me is done i'm i'm different now and i i was like figuratively kind of flushing those horrible painful uh memories being bullied and things and um it worked like it really worked i got girls i had friends i was you know, head of the fraternity, uh, every single good thing that could have happened to me. I had the best four years and I attributed all the alcohol. And, you know, that was too, certainly a, a huge part of my angle, I guess I call it, because I was always looking for an angle, right? How, how am I going to uh, differentiate and one up? So it was great uh, for, until it wasn't, you know, I, I, I had this thing where like, I thought this was who I was. And I moved to New York city afterwards and I got a pretty lucrative job uh, in commercial real estate. And it also let me like make up excuses about why I was on tours or inspections or appointments. And uh, you know, it kind of gave me a little bit too long of a leash where I could get myself into trouble. Um, But long story short, all these people who I thought loved me for the booze and wanted to be around me because I was a party animal, um, you know, started slowly, but surely, um, you know, distancing themselves and, you know, my sister herself uh, admitted later on, I thought I was the funniest guy ever. Um, I actually have two little brothers and a little sister. Uh, my sister used to call my mom and be like, is Mike going to be at the family event? Because if so, I'm not coming. You know, it's just like, and, and that, finding out that later 
was huge because I thought I was going to lose everything I was about myself. Um, and in reality, you know, I just couldn't read a room. That's basically it. The first thing, first thing my dad said to me was, maybe you'll be self, I left the first AA meeting and called him. He goes, I hope that from now on, you'll be more self-aware. I'll, I'll never forget that. That was his big thing. So, uh, Anyway, so, you know, I'm on this, I'm on this thing. I, I, my little brother finally graduates. I have two, like, again, this, the second one, he, um, and he kind of came to live with me in New York and, you know, no one else would drink or think like me. So I, I kind of paid him to, to hang out with me in a way and supplied our drugs and supplied our booze. And, uh, you know, I made a pretty powerful nine step amends to him just recently. And he actually, um, I have a story about him coming up a little bit, but he, he's got 50 more days than I do. And we actually go to a meeting every day at five o'clock together online. And he lives in Connecticut. And that's how I ended up with David in this, uh, this other meeting. So, um, you know, I'm cruising along, I'm doing my thing. Uh, and then as my partying goes up, I'm staying up longer and longer. I'm taking it more extremes. I have no, you know, no checks, no balances. Um, I actually overdosed for the first time next to that brother um, in about 2006, I got rushed to a detox center in Princeton, New Jersey called the Carrier Clinic. And, um, you know, I have full intentions of getting sober. I have full intentions of this being it. Because I kind of knew that, I, I mean, look, I, I turned blue, stopped breathing, I was done. And, um, you know, I thought that that was going to be my wake-up call. Unfortunately, since I'm Mike Hurl in the fourth and I'm somebody special, I thought when I got out of here, I was going to get parades and endless high fives and, like, you know, everything, every Facebook post anyone ever written was going to be about how sober I was. And no one gave a shit. Everybody just kept on living their own life. And, um, you know, that bothered me. It really did. So I didn't have any sober friends. I went to Atlantic Group in the Upper East Side a few times, judged everybody, some friendly guy. I hope to, I hope to God this guy had an amazing life. But he came up to me and he was like, I don't think you have any sober friends. And I thought in my head, even if I did, it wouldn't be you. That was my thought. And I would think that was my last meeting I went to for 12 years. Um, so uh, what happened is I decided to pick up and I met a girl who turned out to be my wife, who's actually above us in this house right now. We had three beautiful kids. But if you do the math on that, so I overdose, I leave AA, and then I get married. And so I had basically found a drinking buddy and also somebody who um, – you know, I'm loud, I'm gregarious, I have energy. And I found someone who was uh, not, you know, and I, and I really have a lot of shame and guilt too that I think I, I sold her a bill of goods and I got her, basically held her hostage and, um, you know, knocked her up, however you want to say it. This is really being recorded. Oh my God. But anyway, like, <laughs> um, we, you know, I feel like people grow and they can grow together. We grew like this, and it was all my fault. But I'm glad to say now, you know, and I'll, I'll get it. We, we kind of came back like this thanks to AA. But, uh, you know, so so she was my drinking buddy, and it was fun, and it was great. Except, like, you know, I just took it too far. You know, I'm an alcoholic. And, I, you know, when she would go to bed, I would just keep going. And she'd wake up sometimes, and I'd still be there. You know, I'd make an excuse. I'll let you sleep in, babe. Oh, my gosh. So many Sunday mornings. She'd, I'd be like, how did you sleep? She goes, um, you were blasting music at level 100. There's a raging fire with uh, our kids running around it in the fireplace. You're like, burnt, you know, like, oh, I slept great. Like, thanks for the treat. You know what I mean? And like, you know, it, it, it just like, I just wasn't who I had conveyed myself to be. I didn't want who I wanted to be. And, you know, of course, you know, the line was being drawn as I, as I drove drunk a few, uh, you know, here, here and there, like, I made all the mistakes. So um, push comes to shove, March 16th. Uh, a couple things happened that basically, um, and this will be what happens, right? So I lo started losing respect and, and I, she had to do a sternum rub. My wife's a doctor. She did a sternum rub to, on March 16th and uh, she cried and it broke her heart. And I think at that moment she checked out of our marriage. And uh, I, again, like, you know, doing the steps later on, I was able to unpack a lot of this, but I, I was so angry and I couldn't see my part in it whatsoever. And um you know, the thing is, she didn't want to watch me kill myself anymore. And, uh, and, and that was the physical part. Now, on the other end, in order to be with somebody, you have to respect them. And my uh, story, I guess, my claim of fame is, you know, I'm the oldest grandchild as well. So I have the name. I'm the oldest of 26 grandkids on my, on my Irish side. And I have a nun 
for an aunt. Her aunt, her sister Mary Burster of Our Ladies of the Mercy Poor or something like that. And she was a nun and she was a very you know pious, great woman. And she passed away, unfortunately. And as the oldest grandchild, I decided that I'm going to hold the repast and everyone's going to come to my house the night before the funeral and we're going to mourn this woman. And she passed away in July. So everyone's flying in from all across the country, from Montana, from Virginia, North Carolina, you name it. And they all come. And as they're coming over to my house, I'm getting very nervous that I'm going to be hosting all these people. So I start taking shots. And I decided at some point very early in this funeral that it was way too sad for me. And I, the vibe was just way off. So in order to loosen things up, I made a frozen pizza and decided to serve it to the nuns naked. All right. I took all my clothes off out of nuns funeral, but naked with frozen pizza. And, <laughs> and so um, you don't come back from that. Your wife don't respect you no more after that. And apparently the way that I got put clothes back on my wife, no, not her. She checked that my mom and my sister had to wrestle me to the floor and put my fucking clothes back on me. So I, um, I lost a little respect that night and you don't wake up and send a text that says, I'm sorry on that one. So, um, again, that's where my marriage was at. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, she, she found someone else. She found her life raft. She called it and she was going to leave. And, um, whatever reason, you know, I stopped drinking long enough to at least kind of delay that. And then the pandemic hit and, um, the pandemic kind of led to us being, you know, a lot of people being stuck together and stuck in the same house. And, um, you know, I now no longer had a commute. I was kind of on a furlough, a, a leave of sorts. My boss just said, you have some demons. You have to go take care of those demons. Come back when you're ready. And uh, it was, um, you know, a journey. So I just started drinking every single day. It was crazy. Um, and then here's what happened as far as, you know, rebounding into the rest of my life. Uh, my dad called me and he goes, you know, we got to talk about drinking. And I go, ah, oh, finally, you know, my jig's up. I'm busted. I've been drinking every day. I'm a disaster. And he goes, your brother has a problem. And I go, you're damn right. He does. You know, fuck that guy. Let's go get him. You know, like I just pivoted on an instant. And so he goes, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an intervention for him at five o'clock later. So I go, yeah, definitely. It's about time we got, you know, took care of that guy. And so, um, but I had no idea what to do. I had six hours to kill. And I, I so I started tailgating. Start tailgating for my brother's intervention is the only way you can put it. And I showed up onto a Zoom call for his intervention, hammered drunk, and I got kicked out because I was basically, everyone was like, we love you. I hope you're okay. And I was like, look at yourself. You're a disgrace. <laughs> and I was slurring and sloppy. And he goes, I like, he's like, I don't know how, whatever he said, some line, but like he ended up going to rehab. Um, and then I kind of knew that I was <laughs> magnifying glass was going to be on me next uh, because there was no way anybody saw that and didn't say like, OK, yeah, maybe Mike has an issue, too. So um, and also, you know, long story short, you know, I felt like a fraud more than one time in my using days. And I don't think it's it's tough to feel like a bigger fraud than it was that day, you know, to be to be pointing fingers at somebody when in that situation. So. Um, within a, about a few weeks of that, um, it was a really, really, uh, a, a, an aggressively drunk day more than normal. And, um, I really promised myself almost every day I'd stop, you know, and by noon I had cravings and I pick up and, uh, so probably mid June, it's my 10 year anniversary. And I tell my wife, uh, I think I'm going to have a glass of wine. I'd made it about 10 days. And, uh, she said, okay, you know, if you can't not drink the night before a 10 year anniversary, um, then you probably, you know, really have a problem. So now this is like the litmus test, but I guess, uh, you know, it says in the big book a lot, if you can, I'd love this line because it's like, you don't think you have a problem. Fine. Go to the bar and have a drink. Then the next day, go to the bar and have a drink or two and try and stop. And when I read that, I was like, thank God. Cause that's what I did. I just kept putting these tasks on myself, but I wasn't ready. You know, I just flat out wasn't ready. And, um, you know, this last per night, particular night unfortunately led to a, a like a multi-day bender and um i hadn't showered i hadn't shaved i hadn't brushed my teeth like the little sweaters that they talk about like what a visual um what a visual uh but i've been there and i was there and um you know i made a racket i guess in the kitchen and my wife came down lauren her name's lauren so lauren came down and uh 
she goes, what are you doing? And I go, I don't know, but, um, you know, you want to kiss me? Like, I, I basically tried to put the moves on her in this state, like the worst, grossest, most awful wretched state, Gollum, Lord of the Rings, you know, like a uh, <laughs> creature. And um, <laughs> so she said, no, like shocker, right? So then I go, you know what? You know, of course you say no. And then I call, but so then things took a little turn for the dark. And I was like, cause you're a whore. I called her a whore and she reached back and she snapped, bang, right hook, right to the face. But she didn't stop. She did not stop. It was like 10 years of misery and, and, and pain and letdowns and everything that she had in her came, came out in me. And, um, you know, I'm screaming back at her and it's an awful scene. And it's about two in the morning at this point. Um, I look up, actually, you know, I'm getting these blows rained upon me and I, I wanted to fight back, but I don't know what to do. So I grab a set of keys and I looked up and I saw my son, my nine-year-old son at the time. So I had a nine-year-old, a six-year-old boy, and then an infant girl. And uh, I could have stopped. I could have done nothing, but I threw the keys. And the keys almost hit him. They just about missed his foot. But as soon as I did it, he looked at me and he goes, nobody loves you. We never loved you. Get out of this house and get out of our lives forever. And I just, uh, so I grabbed the bottle of pills. I grabbed the bottle of vodka. He threw a vase at me. He's protecting his mother like her life depends on it. And he's right, uh, screaming hysterically. She's screaming hysterically. And they chase me out of the house. And I jump in the car before they can even stop me. And I check in the hotel. And I thought that was it. I was like, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to wake up. This is over. There's a line from a Pearl Jam song where it says, um, I thought you'd hold me till I die. I'll see you on the other side. And I, I thought of that. I texted her that. And I went to bed. I thought I'd kill myself. And I, I woke up. And I found out um, this past New Year's, Jacob is his name, and Lauren told me for the first time that that night they were all huddled in bed together. They had the door locked. And they said, we're terrified that dad's going to come home tonight. But we're also terrified that dad's never going to come home. Because they knew, you know, from that text, and they didn't know where I was. They couldn't find me. I woke up, 100 missed calls from my parents, um, you know. And guys, like, maybe I spent a lot of time kind of building the setting, the scene. But, like, I, I thought that I was designed and destined to be somebody special or at least be, you know, fulfill my um, potential in whatever that is. And instead, here I am in a hotel room with my kids terrified of myself. Yeah, I, I just, it's really hard to look at sometimes, you know, it's so painful and it's so like, it doesn't feel like these things actually happen to me sometimes because it's just not who I ever thought I would be. And um, luckily though, it's not, you know, who I am now. So, you know, I came home and I had texted my brother, Chris and my dad. I said, I think I need an A. I think I need to go to AA. That was what I wrote. I was like, duh. Right. But like, that's what I wrote. So Chris said, why don't you come to this 7.30 meeting um, and check it out and, and we'll go from there. It's a really good group of guys. So and this is what, like, this is now what it's like because that first day I showed up and I hear this all the time now, but I heard guys laughing. And like, you know, I went from suicidal, like to now guys laughing and they didn't have a lot of cares. I'm sure they had things in their personal life, but in that moment they were breaking each other's balls. They were hanging out and they were laughing. And that was foreign to me. You know, I love to laugh. I love to be around it. But like that, that just not, it wasn't where I was in life. So I, I was attracted by that. And then I said, anybody here counting days? You know, I'm like, hi, I'm Mike Kay. And I, I only say Mike Kay, not my own name, because I'm like superstitious. I, I don't know. I kept it that way that first day. And I was like, I never want to change it now because I didn't, I didn't stop coming. You know, like, that's it. So like, what if I put my whole name there and I start, you know, I, I, things are too good. So I sent him out call. You know, I didn't get struck by lightning. I didn't like, you know, find a meaning of life, but uh, a huge weight fell off my shoulders because it was like, oh my God, like I didn't tell a lie. Like I actually came clean. And um, so I'm there, I'm committed, I'm ready. And uh, I find a sponsor and he starts telling me these things that like, by God, you know, I've never heard of in my life. There was a foreign concept, but it's like, Keep your own side of the street clean. Because I think every time I called him, I was just like, I can't believe she left her marriage. I can't believe um, like I got bullied in sophomore year of high school. I can't believe all these different things. It was like, just keep your side of the street clean. Do the next right thing. You know, do the next right thing. And um, it, it turned out 
that, um, you know, and then the other one was like, and then I was like, why doesn't everybody trust me? I, I just want to be trusted. And I would tell everyone I came out of the meeting, like, Hey guys, I've been to three meetings now. It's time, you know, time to trust me and love me again. And you know, they were cringing, right? Like they were like, no, like you threw a fucking keys in a vase at me. Like, get it, yo, get out of here, dude. Like leave us alone. So I found this line that said like, you have to become trustworthy before you can become trusted. And it's like, wow, how basic is that? And then, you know, you can't really keep score. It's not like, okay, do you trust me now? Do you... So I, I, I was focused in on like doing the next right thing. And, and uh, so I'm in real estate, like I said. So I showed this building one time, like very early in sobriety. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And this rabbi walks down the street and this rabbi is like, hey, what are you doing? Are you, are you doing this for something? And I'm like, you know, I, I give him my whole little background, which is very complicated, but, you know, not the point of this show tonight. And uh, I go, we start talking and he goes, my philosophy on spirituality is that life is infinite moments. And each moment is like this. And if you live in a spiritual good life in this moment right now and in the next moment and in the next moment, before you know it, you've been spiritual for a minute, an hour, a day, a week. And you're this like God fearing, you know, good person. And I'm like, that's so unbelievable. And I found out later on, you know, that step 10 to me is, you know, life for me now is trying to do the next right thing in every moment. And then when I don't do the next right thing and I have that little pit in my stomach, like, "Eh, oh, no, that wasn't right. I can either ignore it and shove it down or like step 10, right? Like I'll make an immediate amends. I'll address what I did. And then I can go back to creating those infinite moments. So, um, you know, there's little things like that that have happened, but that's what recovery has has done for me. It has made me feel like when I look in the mirror or when I call family members, I don't feel like a fraud. I don't feel like I've, you know, I think about like my parents taking me home from the hospital. I think about that all the time. And I'm like, all their hopes and dreams for this child, even if he doesn't become president, right? At least don't be like cracked out at four in the morning with the birds coming up and like all the horrible things, you know, that I became when I was using drugs and alcohol. You know, I can look at myself in the mirror and and, and be comfortable with uh, at least trying my best. So, um, you know, the steps obviously were something that, you know, I wanted to get an A, an AA, I guess. So, you know, get an A in recovery, Captain Rehab, I think they called me. It was just like, you know, like I just wanted to be the best at doing it. So I was like, let's get into these steps. You know, I cleared out a couple hours. Let's hammer through them. (laughs) My sponsor, the best thing you ever did. He kept me on like step six for like four months. Like, you dick, like. Dude, like I, I, I've given up my re- defects like 80 times. He's like, no, you haven't. You're not even willing, you know? And th- that was my process. And I'm glad he, he, he took my upbeat, crazy, impulsive nature and, and he tried to slow it down. But like, um, you know, what we did do, and every time I'm in a step meeting and four or five come up, because I interchange those, those changed my life. There's no doubt about it. And I say that without hyperbole. Like when I read step four and it describes the two people that, you know, I forget even what the one of them is because it doesn't affect me, so I don't pay attention. But the one that's like every single thing in life happened to him and literally nothing happened because of him. I'm like, how did this guy write this in the 30s and 40s and just just peg me, just pe- literally peg me and know everything about my deepest secrets and, and every justification I've ever had? Um, and so I wrote it all down and I spent an hour on step five or two hours, however long it took. And then that's what my sponsor said, like, hey, man, do you realize you just spent two hours telling me every resentment you've ever had in life and not anything you've done. And I'm like, damn, you're right. And I'm like, wow. Like that's how I've spent my whole every day on earth, you know, blaming everyone for everything ever. And so, you know, when people say steps give you a spiritual awakening, it's not hyperbole. Like I I just want to shake people who refuse to do it because I'm like, if you're authentic and genuinely throw yourself into this program, um, this is not about not doing something for me. If my life was about not drinking, then I would sit some kind of plateau and that would be that. And that'd be what I focused on, like slapping my hand away from the fridge or something. Like what kind of life is that? My life now, it's about it's about doing the right thing in these moments. It's about not trying to blame others, but trying to like let people around me thrive, not like suffer from the disease of being near this guy who's like a vortex of good energy just just be a positive influence and uh so it's about growth and it's about um transmitting love and some guys i know slap me when i try to say that but i don't care i love that like that's what it is it's just general term transmit love um so that's what recovery became for me and it's become for me as well just like about 
looking forward and about doing and not about folk, you know, not drinking is a byproduct of living my best spiritual life is how I'd like to put it. Um, and you know, I'm not perfect. Like fighting with, uh, fighting with the kiddos a little bit over bed, you know, whatever. I, you know, like life is lifey, right? Like there's no, there's no perfect serenity. It's just, I try to keep the highs and the lows different. And, you know, um, I don't even know how much time I've left, but I, I'd like to share a couple of things about like real life examples of, of what's going on. Um, so this oldest boy, so the nine, six, and my, my daughter, my infant daughter is like my best friend. She's never seen me drunk. We have an unbelievable bond. She's four and a half now. I can't even begin to describe how, how much I love all of them, but like, she's got this innocence to her and, and I can't help but know why the middle guy, you know, he's, he, he kind of remembers, but he, we talked about it the other day and you know, he, he, it's not really a scar to him, but the oldest guy, man, he, he lived it. Like he lived it. And uh, he had a stutter that was so overwhelming. And um, it basically was because he didn't feel safe anywhere. He had a stutter that got him bullied at school. And then when he came home, he either had a drunk dad, a hungover dad, an angry dad. I was, there was no consistency. I, I, I missed on the bare minimum of making him feel safe and providing a, a secure environment. And so um, you know, as I made amends to him living and, and verbal and we're recovering, you know, he, he's like blown up into this. He's left tackle on the football team. He's a defensive end. Um, and most importantly, like, you know, for the second time, I think ever the other night, I put him to bed and I thought I heard something. I was at door closed. I go, everything okay? And he goes, yeah, but I just wanted to tell you, I love you. And I was like, I love you too, man. I love you too. And um, he just volunteered the other day like, you know, the school play and he didn't, he wasn't like the leader or anything, but he was actually the announcer who announced the people when they come out. And I'm like, are you, you know, are you sure you want to do this or whatever? And he's like, yeah, of course I got it. So literally a couple of weeks ago, I'm in the audience of this thing in the middle of the day, he steps up, he grabs a microphone and he nails it like conviction, uh, authority. And he looks at me across the thing and he smiles and like nods his head. And I was just like, it took everything to not weep in front of the whole school, you know? And it's like, that is him and his true self because he can, he can be, you know? And so, um, you know, I didn't get a Disney ending out of him when I made my amends. Some of them were Disney ending, as I like to call it. His was not, but, uh, but that was, you know, early on. We're still, we're still growing. We're still doing so, um, you know, and, uh, so that's, that's, that's the example of that I, uh, I have a sponsee took him through steps, you know, um, I'm really just in my mind, um, I try and give as much as I can. Cause I, I owe this program so much, but I definitely, I did, I get defensive of AA. I don't want to call it a cult. I, it, it, for me, it's a program of recovery and the fellowship is, is the key to that for me, you know, just being in rooms with people who think like me, drink, like drank, like me, you know, and just identifying with each other. So because of that, if it's not a call, it's a text, but I love to stay connected as much as I can. Um, I think isolating or leaving is probably the worst thing I could do. So um, when someone asks me to be of service and tell my story or, or, or do whatever, I, I, I just say, yes, there's, there's no way around it because I, I owe my life to AA. I guess the last thing I'll say is like, I avoided coming here because I thought my life would be over. And I'm not speaking cliche. I'm speaking legit. I thought it would be over. I'm like, I'm destined to go to basically church once a day for, for eternity and, and, and do homework and all this stuff and like self I No, what happened is it was the first day of the rest of my life. You know, I made my best friends. I made my brothers. I was able to, you know, just live, um, you know, to try to live at least the best version of myself. And um, I have it all thing because of this program. So um, I guess I'm a, I'm a believer. I love it here. And I, I, I just love being able to, to try and share my message. So um, I have no idea if I ran overtime or under, but I don't care because that's what I got and I'm done. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.